you to unmute. Um, yeah, so welcome back, everybody. Hopefully you had fruitful discussions in your breakout rooms. Um, I know on the Padlet, there was, uh, Jade and I were taking a moment to try and start organizing some of people's comments, and there was a lot of like common themes that came up. Um, and so, yeah, we'll drop the link to that back in the chat. Feel free to take another look at it and sort of see what else folks are saying. Um, and then I'm also wondering if anyone from a breakout discussion wants to share something that you all talked about in your discussion that you felt like was a particularly um, kind of like salient thing that you talked about. And feel free to just um, type stack into the chat as we've been doing if you wanna kind of get in line to, to share back. Nobody wants to share anything that you talked about in your breakout groups. Don't be shy. Okay, I'll go. So we talked about um, more or less <laughs> that uh, it's really hard to actually get more people on board mm. after the meetings, after the Zoom or any other meetings, because they just want to basically, I don't know if they want to do it, but that's what they kind of do. They just meet on Zoom, for example, and they don't really uh, do anything later on. They don't meet in person, really. They don't organize. They don't utilize all that information that they actually got from the meeting. They don't They don't show up to utilize it later on. Mm. So that in short, I would say, yeah. If anybody from my group has more. Yeah, that's a really great one. It's sort of like, how do you how do you go from people's initial interest into getting them to be kind of consistent contributing members of the organization? Um, yeah, and it looks like some folks in the chat resonate with that too. Does anybody else wanna share a thing that came up in your group that you feel like um, might be kind of widely experienced? Yeah, Jonathan from GBTU, go for it. Well, it was it was my pet concern um, answering the question. So, uh, so like in Boston, I'm sure in every American city, uh, you can turn around a corner and find a new terrible uh, landlord fellow. Mm -hmm. And so we keep finding new projects, even following tenants that are our favorite people to work with, moving into new places, a new slumlord situation. So, how does the union as a whole? Um, manage to not keep, to, how do you walk away from those things? Because, you know, for instance, I won't name names, but there's another very engaged member working on yet another one of our projects. And I realized that since we keep overturning these new spaces, even with tenants that have advocacy agency, um, I, I can't help her because I, I'm letting myself always get pulled into a new fertile space. Mm. And I'm sure we all face that. And maybe it's just personal discipline. Um, but as, a, as mo not so much just about me, but as a group, how do we prevent ourselves from endlessly spreading out um, what we're doing? I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a great one. Thank you. Um, I see Julian and then Cece and then Robert on stack. Julian from Tenants United, go for it. Um, in our breakout group, we talked about um, our position as within our communities. Um, I was thinking in the context of I am not who is a organic leader within my community and the challenge that presents to me. Um, but some of my, I think perhaps the more wider one is with newer organizers is this feeling that you're pushing into communities that you are not part of. Um, and the question then becomes, well, why aren't you in, I guess the question I ask is then why, why aren't you, what, what does it mean when you say I'm going into this community that I'm not part of? Um, and yeah, I don't know if Cece is going to say exactly the same thing that I did. <laughs> we were in the same group. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and yeah, uh, CCU are next on stack. 
Yeah, I think Julian, like, just said, summarized exactly what was on talk with God in our group. So, yeah, no need to say more. Thanks. Um, okay, we've got Robert and then Carissa. Um, and then I think maybe we'll stop the stack after that, um, just in the interest of time. But fear not, there'll be future breakouts and opportunities for more discussion. Um, so Robert from MATU, go for it. Yeah, something that we talked about and found that we had in, in common in our breakout was the, the reality of not being able to retain tenants uh, for, mm -hmm. for organizing after um, you know, we've addressed their problem. Um, that's kind of what we found uh, to be a significant uh, issue in in Milwaukee is that you know we'll have you know we've got several dozen cases with tenants open right now um, and we'll go about resolving them and then you know when some kind of resolution comes about for for the tenant um, you know we never hear from them again um, we've only been able to kind of get one one tenant uh, to continue organizing with us in a uh, you know a, a continual way uh, and the rest of us, well, we are tenants, um, you know, we are, mo we're, you know, we're mostly organizing members. Mm. We, we will fight the tenant struggle in our own, uh, you know, houses or buildings or whatever. Um, but, you know, when we, when we do help people, we're just like, we're struggling to find a way to get people to buy into the idea of a union for a tenant, something that, you know, you commit to, um, rather than just something, a resource that can be used and then, you know, you can just kind of ignore and go back to life, I guess. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, that's kind of been our problem. Yeah, totally. And that one came up quite a bit in the Padlet. I see folks agreeing with you in the chat too. Thank you. Um, okay, Carissa, you're on stack. And then I think we'll kind of close the this discussion after that. Um, this is the thing that I raised on the Padlet, but then I'm bringing it up because another uh, member of our breakout group brought it up before me. So it's just the communication challenges, especially with technology and uh, different people's comfort with technology and different people comfort with different platforms and mm -hmm. all of those kinds of issues and how to manage the communication, especially during the pandemic. And um, I was had a brainstorm while we were talking, but didn't share it in my group. And I have no idea if it's possible, but I was just wondering if, if other unions are having that problem, um, if there are um, tools to manage some of that, that we might be able to um, pool our resources to uh, get access to as a whole network. Because uh, I know, you know, paying monthly fees for um, tools like for mass texting or some other options that might help streamline communication uh, feels beyond what our union can manage. But I wonder if there's like a economy of scale, if we could all work together on that. Maybe that's not possible, but that's all. Thank you. Yeah, I love that idea. Um, and that maybe that's something too that um, like the Delaware Council could discuss further in terms of like if Atun could be the uh, medium that like, yeah, buys one mass texting subscription or something that a bunch of people have access to. Um, and then I also wanted to raise to be um, with the comment capabilities on the Padlet, if people are hearing these things and saying like, oh yeah, like we found this great free mass texting program or any other kind of like useful thing like that, um, I'd encourage you to comment on the relevant Padlet comment with like your thing that helped address that challenge in your union. Um, and we're hoping to like keep the Padlet after this session so we can reference it in the future and stuff too. Um, okay, wonderful. Thank you everyone for, um, for doing the breakouts and then for sharing some of what you discussed back with all of us. Um, so I think our plan now is, oh, okay, is, <laughs> um, is to just take a look at, um, the Padlet together. And I think I'll turn it back over to Jade for this section. Yeah, um, do we wanna screen share the Padlet or people can just look at it, right? Yeah, although I can um, screen share it real yeah, quick too. Yeah, I'll, I'll start talking then while you're doing that, if that's fine for everybody. Um, so we obviously had to do a little preparation for this um, session. And so we tried to come, like we started by generating and brainstorming 
all of the problems that we face in our time as, as tenant unionists, um, you're still there to start by, by doing that. Um, and then we tried to categorize those problems um, into, we ended up with around five categories. Um, and so what we tried to do the Padlet was to see where the problems that um, folks shared out in that Padlet, if they fell into those categories. Um, and for the most part, we found that our framework was pretty good. Um, and so the things that we identified um, as like sources of problems were like lack of political development. Um, and so that could either be um, not being able to come up with sufficient tactics for a situation um, or having difficulties with the larger strategy of your tenant union. Um, we also identified um, like harm and interpersonal conflict. Um, and those things are not the same thing. We're going to get into like our definitions of all these in a little bit, but I just wanted to clarify, especially that we're not jumping those things together. Um, and then finally, just broadly speaking, burnout. Um, and so, yeah, those are the categories we identified. The main thing I think that fell in, that didn't fall into these categories that people brought forward. Um, and I'm glad that I mentioned these um, was Chris and Charles sharing about like their sort of capacity related to like language justice um, and communication and just sort of resources more broadly within their unions. Um, and so we're not gonna directly address those problems, but I think that like Kitty was saying earlier, those are problems that hopefully we can address through. Hello, a kind unions. reminder to please slow down. Okay, sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. Through Atun more broadly. Um, yeah, so we had prepared then some presentations to go through. And so we have some common definitions of the problems that we identified um, so that when we go into a breakout later, um, people will be able to choose which of those breakouts they wanna, which of those issues they wanna focus their time on, um, whether it be offering solutions to those problems um, or sharing experiences you had with those problems and getting feedback hopefully from other tenant unionists on places they've had success in combating those problems. Um, was there anything that you wanted to add or should we get into our presentation? Um, I think that we could, yeah, I think maybe let's just get into the presentation. And then after the presentation, we'll have a little bit of time if people have reflections on like this way of kind of breaking out types of problems, we'll have some time to like hear what you all think about this framework that we're proposing basically. Okay, and then I need to stop sharing. How do I do that? <laughs> Um, or I can go ahead and just share if you, if y'all want me to share the, oh, yeah. there you go. You figured it out. Okay. All right. Hang on. Just give me one second. Can everyone see the presentation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, go ahead and if you, you're gonna move the slides, Richard, should we just give you like next? Is the, yep, perfect. Yeah, next is fine. Um, can you go back? Sorry. <laughs> oh, there you go, okay. Uh, and forward. Great. So I'm going to start and talk a little bit about burnout um, and how we uh, want to talk about it today. Um, burnout, uh, there's lots of like research and commentary on it, um, but largely people agree that there are a few characteristics of it, um, and there are a few signs that you might be like prone to burnout. Um, most of the like medical research and like I don't know um, understanding of it is focused on burnout in the workplace. Um, for the most part, uh, our tenant unions are not a workplace. Um, so I do want to address that kind of concern. Um, and so I'll talk about that in a second. 
But uh, yeah, just so that we have a working definition, um, it's a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. Um, and so it's you know not a medical condition, but it might lead to conditions like excessive stress, fatigue, insomnia, substance abuse, and high blood pressure. Uh, could you go to the next one? So if we accept the definition of burnout as a work-related condition, um, why do tenant organizers experience burnout um, despite largely being volunteers? Um, and for, I guess, the evidence of burnout being a problem, um, a lot of people that shared in the Padlet had burnout as a problem. Um, personally, I've experienced plenty of burnout um, in organizing of all sorts. Um, and I mean, the really working hypothesis I have now is that that burnout results from having a job-like relationship with our organizing um, and then taking on too many responsibilities in that job. Um, as a side note, a lot of times when people are experiencing burnout in the workplace, they'll talk to their bosses or their coworkers about it. And oftentimes the answer to their problem will be, oh, you should be doing more self-care. Um, we're not gonna like talk through solutions very much in this portion of the presentation, but I did wanna mention that um, we, you know, we reject self-care as a solution. Um, self-care is very good, right? Like people should be doing things to take care of themselves um, that are nice, you know, the roses in life, but um, self-care is not the solution that we're gonna advocate for. Um, can you go to the next one? So to continue identifying the problem, I wanna just talk through some of like the causes that uh, were identified um, for burnout in the workplace, and then just compare those to problems that we might face in tenant organizing. Um, so the first of those is like having a lack of control um, over like the situations we work in. So in tenant organizing, right, that can look like tenants coming to us in crisis, um, taking on work that has to be done to keep your tenant union running rather than the work that you really want to do. Um, when we're doing things like service work, um, at best, we can negotiate the terms of defeat. Um, so in all those situations, right, we're not in control of, of very much. Um, we're making little impacts, but it can feel very overwhelming. Um, there's also sometimes unclear expectations, right? One of the things about being autonomous is that no one's ever really in charge of your work. Maybe you have accountability with your comrades, um, but if you're, you know, in a tenant union that is dysfunctional, there might not be that kind of accountability and support. Um, towards dysfunction, uh, dysfunctional organizational dynamics can be a cause of burnout. So things like having a lack of, yeah, thank you. Having a lack of developed internal democracy, um, which can lead to like unclear expectations. Um, internal conflict within your organization. And we're gonna talk specifically about inter inter internal conflict later on in the slides. Uh, could you go to the next one? Um, some of the more of the causes of uh, burnout. So extremes of activity. So if you're in a campaign, there can suddenly be like huge demands on the capacity that you have personally. Um, Things like the service work you do can also be monotonous. Um, so, you know, it can feel like, oh, there's a new case this month, a new person who needs my help. Um, there can be a, a lack of social support. Um, so if you're having internal conflict within your union, then maybe the people that you normally would rely on um, aren't there for you. Um, people in your life that don't organize, maybe don't understand um, the problems that you're facing um, organizing. Um, and then finally, uh, a work-life imbalance. So committing time to organizing can result in less time with friends and family, for example, um, doing the things that you enjoy. So yeah, that's my overview of burnout. Um, I think next we've got internal conflict. If you want to skip ahead there, Richard. Yeah. Hi. So um, there's a lot to address within this subject. Um, this is uh, some some things that came out of a conversation we had this morning. So um, it definitely doesn't address the uh, sort of like very wide field of things that could be considered conflict and harm. Um, and uh, we'll sort of get into 
how we see those things. Um, so interpersonal conflict or you know political differences, um, it differs from oppression and interpersonal harm, although they can also relate to each other. Um, we wanna point out that oppression is often structural. Um, it is often not necessarily just about two people or two parties. Um, conflict requires at least two parties with similar amounts of power. Um, interpersonal conflict can look like two people with different political orientations or political development addressing a problem in two different ways. Um, it doesn't have to be political, but a lot of times within our work, it, it is. Um, interpersonal conflict can be based on assumptions or lack of communication. Um, dealing with interpersonal conflict without skills or structures can be very damaging and draining for tenant unions, especially smaller ones. Um, sometimes the systems that we develop um, to address the, this kind of conflict, um, they need to be updated, adapted, or overhauled. So how do we identify when um, that's needed? Um, conflict can also emerge from small interactions and become bigger over time. Um, how does your tenant union practice um, on a regular basis, giving and receiving feedback, organizational analysis, um, and evaluation? So um, we can move to the next. Um, so this is a quote. Uh, and I think it outlines um, some of what, you know, we're trying to grapple with here. Movements can end up in major conflicts that had they been caught at the moment of misunderstanding could have been resolved or avoided. Movements can end up trying to be publicly accountable for instances of abuse, harm, or conflict that, they are, that are personal and require a longer term healing practice than our organizations are equipped to provide. I want to name all of these here because I think they're all part of what's getting collapsed and miscommunicated. In my vision of healthy movements, we are able to easily communicate about whether we are, not, we are in a conflict or a misunderstanding. If we are uncomfortable with how others are navigating contradictions, if we have or are receiving a critique, whether harm has happened or is happening, and whether we are witnessing or experiencing abuse. And that is a quote from Adrian Marie Baum. And apologies, I will slow down, but I'm also done. All right, if you want to hit that next slide, Richard, I'll take it from, I'll take it from here. Okay, um, I'm doing my best moderated speaking to account for our translation process. So this maybe is a little corny, but I opened with a quotation that's often used probably in professional spaces, so I apologize if I am workifying our tenant organizing, but uh, the quotation is, start by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible, and suddenly you are doing the impossible. And what we're gonna focus on in this portion is what's necessary, because without that, we cannot build a movement and we cannot do the impossible or seemingly impossible work of overturning real estate capital's chokehold on our lives. Uh, next slide, Richard. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, a solid organizational structure will go a long way toward successful organizing and will generally uphold three things. Accountability is one, transparency is another, and efficiency is a third. So what does a solid tenant union look like? Next slide. So on the first part about uh, organization, uh, and accountability. A lack of accountability within a tenant union can take on many forms. Uh, some of what this looks like could be 
a union that is led by activists rather than tenants, which I think is something that came up in our first uh, breakout session. Um, I just want to say when I when I mention these things, it is not in a judgmental way at all. The whole point of this session is so that we can I self identify some issues, critique ourselves and learn and grow. So don't take it like I'm calling anybody out in the uh, audience. This is for us all to learn. Um, Another uh, symptom could be that the union has a structure that not everyone understands or is not clearly defined. Uh, the union may be inaccessible. So, for example, not holding regular meetings or not making an effort to include folks that maybe don't have Zoom capabilities or are, um, you know, immunocompromised and cannot uh, meet in person, those sorts of things. Um, it could also be a union that does not share leadership. It could be a union that discourages open dialogue. It could be a union that does not allow for criticism in good faith, which is a very difficult thing, actually, especially in newer organizations where you may not know the other members very well. Um, it's it can be difficult to uh, take a critique um, and learn from it rather than, you know, immediately um, sort of take it personally. That that uh, that open dialogue requires some real relationship building. And finally, it could be a union that values competition over collaboration. So don't look at union organizing as a zero sum game. Um, it's not about which cliques within the union have the most power or who's trying to, um, you know, which project is most important. We want to collaborate with one another rather than compete. Um, okay, next slide, Richard. Um, another um, thing that we that I mentioned at, at the top was uh, transparency. Now, transparency, uh, I'll just say, is often offered as this sort of cure-all. You know, you'll hear people talk about good governance, and the thing that we need is sunshine or disinfectant to clean out all the bad things that are happening in the world. Um, so I'll just preface it with, Transparency, not for transparency's sake, but transparency in order to build trust with your fellow union members. So you want to ask yourself, is your tenant union open and honest about its values, its goals, its guiding principles or tendencies? And as I mentioned previously, the structures that found it that uh, comprise its base. Um, you know, a lot of folks find it difficult to be very upfront with their uh, political um, values. They don't want to scare off potential members of the union. But it's important, I feel, to be open and honest about these things, to let people know upfront, this is our project, this is what we're here to build, and this is what we believe in. Also, think about do you have redundancy built into key positions, such as your treasurer, in order to avoid questions of legitimacy or malfeasance, and in order to better share workload. So a lot of folks in breakout sessions earlier were talking about how much work often falls on very few people by establishing clear roles and by supporting these union members with multiple um you know with with multiple lines you can bolster your ability to organize don't let it fall on the person or couple of people who happen to have the most time that week be proactive about building these things in but as i mentioned earlier keep in mind that security and your strategy will necessitate some secrecy. 
don't be afraid of that. The landlords that we organize against, they organize in secret. They don't tell us their plans, right? So do not do like transparency ultra mode. Don't be out there airing all your dirty laundry and giving everyone the game away. Um, see, uh, transparency, like I said, to build trust within the union, but not transparency for transparency's sake. Next slide. And finally, decision making or efficiency. Many of us come from advocacy or academic backgrounds that value consensus. Just a couple notes on this. Consensus can be powerful. Wherever possible, strive for broad agreement between members. It is more difficult, but consensus will lend your work additional strength and legitimacy. However, do not fall prey to the tyranny of consensus. Union membership is diverse and may represent multiple tendencies. Do not allow consensus to get in the way of organizing. Um, so in closing, build robust but flexible mechanisms for decision making. Don't fear dissent, but also avoid gridlock. Next slide. And uh, I'll just, uh, I'm not going to read this because I think we're running a little bit over on time, but this is, this is a very powerful uh, uh, note on the structurelessness problem that we often face, um, but we'll, we'll move on to the next one. Thanks, Richard. Okay. Um, so the last part of this is like the political development part that Jade touched on earlier. And we sort of thought about this as having two kind of subparts. And one is your union strategy and vision or lack thereof, right? Not all housing work is tenants' rights work. We've talked about that a lot in this session. Um, and if your union doesn't have a clear strategy and a vision and an understanding of what you're about or at least want to be about, it's easy to get pulled into a bunch of directions, focus on policy, focus on raising awareness or building coalitions rather than actually organizing and doing movement building. Um, and then kind of on the flip side, it's easy to hyper-focus on like your political tendency um, in a way that doesn't necessarily serve serve you. Um, and something that I just wanted to throw out there for consideration is I think one challenge that I've has come up in our union, I think some people touched on this earlier, is this idea that a rigid strategy um, and kind of a pretty tightly defined vision can feel like it's in conflict with being a member-led organization that's responsive to the interests of the people that are joining the union. Um, and you know, a lot of us try and have very anti-hierarchical democratic organizations. So something to just throw out there for future thought is how do you maintain um, a union that has those desirable like democratic attributes without subjecting yourself to constantly also having shifting goalposts and kind of mission creep as like the new kind of flavor of the month of what is interesting crops up for people. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so what are some indications that your union might benefit from focusing a little bit more on your strategy? Uh, one thing that we thought about is if you often find yourself kind of caught on your back foot responding to external circumstances rather than carrying forward something that you and your, the, your fellow members decided you wanted to work on together. Um, again, like if the focus of your meeting kind of swings wildly from month to month or meeting to meeting, if it's hard to describe to people what your union or your local is up to, um, those might indicate that there's not quite a strategy uh, that's as well defined as you want. Um, and so then another question is to just throw out and think about is has anybody successfully refocused your union if you felt like you kind of had scattered people in projects and what did it take to do that? Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, and so then the other part of the political development stuff is the tactics, right? And tactics are like the activities that you carry out to get you closer to your strategy. Um, and I really like this thing that I 
modified very slightly for the Midwest Academy, which is that tactics must be, and people have said this earlier in context, right? They need to relate to like the context of your city and the organizing there. They need to be flexible and creative. They need to relate back to your strategy and vision. They need to make sense to your membership and they need to be backed up by a specific form of power. So in other words, like trying to pull off tactics with a type of power that you don't have isn't gonna work. If your tactics all rely on mass mobilization and your union only has 15 people, you're not going to be successful, even if that's a good tactic to use in your situation in the absence of considering like your resource constraints. Um, next slide. So how do you know that your tactics fit with your strategy, right? Union organizing is hard and sometimes doing a reasonable thing with a good chance of success doesn't work in the specific situation you're in or it doesn't initially pan out. I know for sure we've like canvassed places and felt like we were getting nowhere and then months later had those people contact us and say, hey, we kept all your flyers. Um, so, right, so it's hard. It can be hard to know when you're doing it right, basically. Um, and so that's just something to, again, throw out to think about more is how do you know when it's time to switch up your tactics versus when it's time to just sort of like keep going and like stick with your plan, plan a little bit longer. But two things to think about are if you've been putting in a lot of work and not getting a lot of results from it, maybe that's an indication that your tactics are wrong or at least ones that you don't have the right, right resources to do well. Um, or if you're trying things that you think are gonna work out and instead unexpected things that you didn't want happen, right? So if you canvas buildings and instead of getting people that wanna organize, you just get a bunch of people like calling you in crisis, hoping for kind of like help in a more service oriented way and you don't have a good way to redirect those people, maybe that's a bad tactic to use in that, that moment, right? And so then how do you assess and reroute? Again, this is, we're really kind of throwing in this out there for further, further thought. But one thing I did wanna raise is the importance of like having an idea of what you think success will look like before you start and then keeping track of what you're doing. Um, I know for us, it's kind of surprisingly hard, like we'll go Canvas and feel some type of way about the Canvas, right? Like that felt like it went well, that felt like it went poorly, um, but that doesn't always track very well to like the reality, like, oh, sorry, I'll try and slow down. Um, you know, so say you Canvas a building and you feel like it went terribly and no one was interested, but then you go back and look and you say, well, there's, um, you know, 200 units in this building and we actually only talked to 10 people here like we don't really know yet whether this building is a building that people are going to want to organize in or not um so just some things to think about in terms of like thinking through your tactics and thinking through how to decide if your tactics are the right ones for your situation um okay and i think that that's the end of the political development section um so Let's see, did somebody, what, I think that we're a little bit behind on time, so we might be changing our plan. Oh, okay. Um, and, and so I think what we're gonna do is originally we were thinking that we would get some feedback right now on like this presentation and what you all think about these divisions. But I think that in the interest of time, we'll just go straight into some breakout groups focused on the five areas, so burnout, harm and interpersonal conflict, um, kind of like organizational structure, tactics and strategy. Um, we'll go into breakout groups for about 10, 15 minutes and just um, chat about each of those like specific types of challenges. And if you feel like you have a situation relating to one of them that you'd like input on, that would be a good breakout room to go to. Or if you feel like your union has successfully addressed one of those types of challenges, um, maybe go to that room instead so you can share some of your like wins and learnings. Um, so yeah, we'll do the breakout rooms and then we'll come back for like a final kind of like closing reflection thing after that. Um, and so I think the plan here, hopefully if we can pull it up wise, is um, you'll be able to like pick a breakout room and we'll try and name them like those things. So you can go to the one that relates to your interest. And we will have, um... The main room, it will be the interpretation and bilingual room, and it will also be um, general for any of these topics. So if you don't have one specific one of these areas, feel free to hang out in this room, as well as if you need um, interpretation. 